Bella, thank you so much. Uh, well, I've spent, I'm an escape artist. I guess everyone at Google is a form of escape artist, but I escape to remote places all the time. If you want to find your way to some tribal group or see the world's weird, weirdest slug, you know, just talk to me. I'll find the answers that you need. And uh, over the years, I've just continued to do what I did when I was a child, which is just look for things I like wherever they are. And Geographic has given me opportunities for that and other research uh, venues. And uh, I, I just keep going. And during all that time, I've spent uh, a fair amount of days with both creatures that have interesting societies and human tribal groups and hunter-gatherer groups. And I began to think about how those groups form and stay together over time and what that means. So for the last six years, I've been a hermit. Melissa has put up with me being at home in front of the computer too often. She's in the back there. We'll give her a round of applause so we can not have to repeat it at the end. And so I have been Mr. Boring for too long. When this book is out, which was yesterday, I will disappear. I'm giving you the chance to see me, then I'm like, flash, out of here. Well, okay, I'm stuck giving a few more talks, but <laughs> in any case, this is a book now called The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. And uh, uh, we all know what a human society is, but you know, in brief, it's a well-defined group with certain specific members with a strong feeling of allegiance and often a, a feeling that you can fight for and even die for that group. Uh, societies last through the generations, and we expect membership in them to be involuntary. And when you think of societies in that way, you'll see that a number of animals have societies too, uh, meerkats, for example, uh, and then there are insects with societies, like the honeybee. And uh, what makes societies alike and different, and what this says about humans is really what this book is about. And to get this in a nutshell, I want you to consider the most remarkable thing in the world. It is across the street from Google. It is a Starbucks. Now, you can walk into a Starbucks and not instantly want to kill everyone, run away in terror, or at least walk up to every individual and find out who they are and what they're doing. This is something pretty unique to humans across the vertebrate animals. A chimpanzee could not do this. A chimpanzee would go on a killing spree or just try to get out of there as fast as possible. The difference is that chimps do not allow for strangers, whereas humans can deal with strangers hundreds of them, and of course in New York, potentially tens of thousands of them a day, and nothing bad happens. So how did this come about? I argue that this is a pivotal turning point in human evolution that's been really ignored, and it's a part of our brain that eventually led to the possibility of having nations. Now to uh, give you a reference point for the argument, I'm going to speak to the social brain hypothesis, which has gotten a fair amount of news. Uh, you've probably heard of it. It's this idea you can have about 150 friends. And this is uh, uh, an assessment based on our brain size. Chimpanzees can have a smaller number of allies. Humans can have more. And the idea is that our brains are largely big in order to increase our social networks because they're so expensive to maintain. But the idea ends up with a problem. And Robert Dunbar, who came up with this notion, addressed this problem, or at least mentioned it, when he first uh, proposed it. Yeah, and that is shown here. It's from this original paper. How is it that, despite the apparent cognitive constraints on group size, modern human societies are nonetheless able to form super large groups 
nation states. Um, what is it about us? What holds us together? So I just want you to think about this immense breakthrough in our past that seems so simple, and it's ended up allowing a huge number of people to be together and assess each other and even uh, relate across societies. At the same time, it's given us all kinds of social baggage that we have to deal with. Uh, and yet, I don't think we're ever going to be able to lose societies. There's some arguments that we should, but it's not going to happen. Societies give us a sense of meaning and validation. And uh, they're a yearning that's very, very basic to our psychology. It's deeply rooted within us. Thanks so much. Okay, I went, went a couple minutes long, but are there a couple, any questions out there? Hi there, Dr. Mata. Thanks so much for that uh, presentation. I was really interested to learn uh, the parts you talked about, what identify in different societies and humans and others. It made me think that, is it true for humans that what the purpose or benefit of a human society is, is the ability to make assumptions about the person that you identify in it? Yes, and those are, are, of course, biases, and those kind of biases are linked to our categorization of others. And I didn't go into those issues, but a big part of the book is looking how those categorizations work, which include uh, not just societies, but now ethnic groups and races within them. So we take a continuum and carve it up very, very efficiently, and we don't allow for uh, intermediates. We make assumptions about who belongs and who doesn't. So humans seem to engage in an interesting activity whereby we go to other societies and they see us being different and they don't kill us and sometimes we you know, buy things from them, like tourism. Right? Are we the only species that does something like that or do you see that in other animals even if they're invertebrates? Yeah, no, invertebrates don't do that at all. Invertebrates are all about us, they kill them. Humans are amazing for the degree of our ability to take in other identities and assess them as potential partners. And uh, things like bonobos can get together and groom each other, but they don't form an alliance to take over the third bonobo troop over there that they don't like, or to figure out how to collect something from a tree or anything. There is no, none of these alliance type things that happen in humans are found anywhere else. The closest possibility are the sperm whales where two societies can apparently get together and hunt together more efficiently sometime for squid, they eat squid, than they can separately. So they may be able to work together in the sperm whale. But it's, a, it's obviously a big cognitive leap and an interesting part of the whole story. Yep? Do ant colonies at war um, allocate resources differently or is it just a boundary condition between colonies? Uh, and colonies at war? Yes. Uh, they don't allocate, we don't know that. That'll be interesting to know. What is clear is that warfare arises in ants, and in fact, in I did an article for Scientific American on ants and the art of war, showing that there are all kinds of parallels. And the very existence of warfare, which is a mass phenomenon where both sides face uh, cat catastrophe, so it's not a one-sided thing. If you look at war, and that's what we usually mean by war, uh, those kinds of aggression uh, occur when societies get, you know, tens of thousands or bigger in both humans and ants. And once you have more and more individuals in a society, the per capita cost goes down. There are lots of uh, studies showing that. And so you end up with this labor pool, and you just sit around and be used for things like battles, or in the case of humans, diverted into arts and sciences, luckily. We don't just use them for battles. But arguably, you need a large population. But whether they allocate things differently when they actually have the battle, no one knows. So it seems like human societies were able to evolve our markers. So if you think of nation states, uh, you know, we're able to evolve what that means and what groups count in it and not. Is there a parallel in the animal world? Like are ants able to change their chemtrails or like their trails uh, as, as members join or as history happens? Well, the, ironically, the one case where this is known well is in the slavery ants. And there are ants that take slaves 
and they take slaves that are young ants, and uh, those ants emerge in the colony like a baby chick learning who its mother is. Uh, they learn the identity of their society. But those slaver, slaves were taken from a different colony, so they don't have the same scent. And it turns out all the ants are grooming each other all the time and probably exchanging the scent. And so it is allowed to live just because it's conforming to this scent, but that means the scent itself is changing all the time. So the ants, and, and there are other cases as well, uh, showing that ants are actually quite uh, smart, despite the tiny brain, at, at tracking what the scent is, and they never make mistakes. And if that slave goes out and encounters its mom, mother's colony, where it should be, it's attacked. So you talked about how uh, societies are temporary, and there's an identity split, and a society is split at some point. So if you think about it, Google is sort of like a society with like 100,000 people. So like, what lessons would there be for a company like Google, where you have all these people and they have to work together? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the, the legally, uh, large corporations are treated like uh, individuals sometimes. In fact, they have some properties of societies, like this identity, unity, and so forth. Whether they stay through the generations, the, so since I had for the original IBM that their grandkids would still be working for it, uh, is uh, uh, maybe a listen, missing part of that uh, parallel. But you know, basically, uh, it's hard to say within the uh, at the corporate level. No one's looked at things in the corporate level. Actually, someone should to see how corporations often split apart and so forth over time. I really can't answer that in detail, but it's a very good question. Thanks. Yeah, what are your thoughts on, I know, uh, like for, for humans, not ants here, like the rise of intercultural, interracial marriages and relationships. Do you see like, um, you know, is this, is this forming new societies or is this just blending different traditions? And because it seems like we're able to do this a lot more easily now than, than in the past. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, well, it's really interesting. I mean, there's this thought that the whole world is getting Americanized by movies and, uh, you know, McDonald's and McDonaldization or whatever that's called. In any case, uh, when you look through the literature, the sense is that uh, uh, the societies is stay staunchly separate and, in fact, may increase their differences. Places like China are perhaps even more Chinese than they were before because the, one's need for the help of outsiders actually often causes the in-group to become more rigid and more set in its ways and more distinctive. That doesn't mean you're not uh, uh, relating to each other all the time in a useful way, but the societies stay sable throughout those, uh, those processes. And you know, the interesting part, another part of your uh, question was about people uh, between societies and so forth linking up. And one of the amazing thing about, things about humans is we are able to take individuals from other societies and they can join our own. So in the past, it would have been refugees or marriage partners. As I said at the beginning, a certain number of people have to transfer between societies just to interbreed when our societies were small. And in the case of humans, that means they had to take on certain attributes of the group that they're joining. So they'd have to learn language and some of the behaviors, but they'd never be perfect at it. We can never completely drop our identities. So even today, we see with immigrants, after two or three or four generations, there'll be a lot of the uh, nuances taken on, maybe even that walking style and so forth, but there's still a sense of difference, and that's maintained actually by the rules of the society. I won't go into it, but uh, this yin and yang of belonging and being different is a really interesting part of the whole human dynamics. It's amazing it works. Thank you. Um, so the societies that you present seem to be very based on physical proximity. And I'm wondering if you see any trends in humans especially of, of creating societies that are not based on, on this kind of proximity or territory. Yes, well, there, uh, actually there are cases, the most interesting cases in the animal kingdom are the ones that aren't based on proximity. Things like wolves and elephants and chimpanzees can spread over the landscape and still remember each other. And uh, in fact, they can remember each other sometimes 
for years. And this capacity to retain relationships over the long term is amplified in humans because our early societies particularly were highly spread out and you might not see somebody for years and they might look different, they've aged certainly, or you might meet a complete stranger and yet you can be comfortable with them uh, within you know, moments as long as they weren't angry. I mean, they can be people you don't wanna deal with that day, but this capacity for dynamics over space and time is what really makes humans uh, different from a lot of these species to a different degree than the others. In, in terms of like, they're, they're still contiguous it seems. I mean, can I be embedded in another, in another set of people and be a member of, of a society somewhere else? Well, it's an interesting question because basically uh, there's not a lot of information on, from psychology on some of these uh, possibilities. Uh, it seems to be if we're part of two different societies, we tend to have a stronger relationship with one of them and see ourselves more different and distinct from the other. Uh, not to go directly into an ant example, but I will go directly into an ant example, and that is these, uh, the, very la the large colony that's taken over Southern California, most of it with a trillion individuals, controls all the port cities of Southern California, and it's boarded the ships, and it's now the same colony that's uh, conquered a thousand miles of the European coastline. You can take an ant from California to Europe and it's just fine. You can take it to parts of Europe where other colonies have gotten in and it's killed. So these ants are actually expanding at a global level as societies, uh, giving it sort of a situation like Alaska and Hawaii is from the continental US, a, a continuum with leapfrogs from place to place. Yep. Well, uh, one for work and society. And I have a particular question regarding humans. Uh, the examples you gave with the animals and insects, they always have like some of them as specific features that drive the most division or unity. And in humans, what I mean, in your research, what is the feature or characteristics in us that drive us division or unity? Do you have like a top? Well, it seems to vary a lot. You know, I was looking a lot through the early anthropology literature because many anthropologists don't even think hunter-gatherers had societies. And that's because they're looking at uh, hunter-gatherers today that are embedded in uh, other uh, societies themselves. But if you look at the early societies, you can see that there would be brands spread out and there'd be a thousand or two people that would share this identity. And, uh, you know, how this uh, is maintained over time and what causes the breakdown is the big question. Sometimes you hear the stories about it being very little things, like someone insulted some aspect of some ritual or something. And sometimes it seems to be about big things. It's really hard to say what gets people excited sometimes. But uh, clearly, uh, the last step, you know there's trouble when one of these subgroups within the society gives itself its own name. <laughs> Names are important. Once you have your own name, you're probably on the way out or the way in, depending on your, whether you want to be in that group or not. So. Thanks. One of the things that I find really interesting about human evolution is our relationship with dogs and how we as a species co-evolved with dogs and forming those relationships to the point that today, like you could say that they really are part of our society rather than just us using them as tools. Right. I'm curious is your opinion on that relationship? Yeah, no, I think they can be viewed as part of the society. I had a paragraph about this and it's one of these little things that had to get out of the book. But uh, once you're totally interlinked and your identity is interlinked with theirs, uh, by the definition of looking at society's identity, uh, dogs become part of our, uh, at least our families, but uh, also our societies. And it's the same with human crops, which are totally dependent on us, and even ant crops, those leaf cutter ants are agriculture, ag agricultural, cultural, and so their crops are only found with their particular nest that nest has a relationship with that particular breed of crop and will kill anything that looks identical to us that comes from outside. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to Dr. Moffitt for your presentation today. Thanks.
This is sort of a practice run, so let me know anything you like, and uh, you can email me there with any thoughts.